When the Radeon 7000 series came out 10 years ago, it was a big leap over the previous generation of AMD cards. It reclaimed the performance crown from Nvidia, and they remained capable and trusty gaming cards for many years, with some people still using them to this day. I'm sure many of you would consider the 7000 series to be one of the greatest generations of graphics cards of all time, but I also think it's the moment that AMD fell behind Nvidia, something that lasted for the best part of 10 years. It opened the way for thousand dollar graphics cards like the Titan, and had the 7000 series come out any later, then I believe it would have been horrendously overclocked, gaining it the same underwhelming, power hungry reputation that plagued the rest of the GCN era of AMD cards. And I have to do this video now because if I wait much longer then AMD's new upcoming 7000 series of graphics cards will come out and then things will get very confusing indeed. It's amazing to think their names have come full circle since then. Also, if you're in the market for very sweet tasting caffeinated drinks, then check out my GamerSup sponsored link in this video's description, which helps support this channel and might even score you a waifu or two. So my first reason for why the 7000 series was a disappointment is if we consider what came before, that being the 6000 series. But before we can understand that generation, we need to go back further still. Way back, in fact, to 2007. To AMD's 2000 series of cards, which was a disappointment, being slower, later and more power hungry than Nvidia's cards were. So AMD went back to the drawing board, they revised their strategy, and planned smaller, cheaper and more efficient cards in the form of the 3000 series. I wouldn't say it was a complete success, but it set the stage for the famous and brilliant 4000 series which I believe is still one of AMD's finest moments. That was the graphics card generation where, although it didn't beat Nvidia's fastest cards, they were cheap enough and still fast enough to render them redundant. AMD built on this success with the 5000 series, which was when they finally clawed back the performance crown from Nvidia, after years of failing to do so. So between the earlier successes of the 4000 and 5000 series, and the later success of the 7000 series, the 6000 series was where it all went a bit wrong. What we got was still fine, but it was meant to be so much more. With the 5000 series, AMD were on a 14 nanometer node and had hoped to shrink down to 32 nanometers for the 6000 series, which together with slight but smart adjustments to its architecture, would have been a great improvement over their 5000 series of cards, maybe enough to defend the performance crown from Nvidia. But that isn't what happened. TSMC cancelled their 32 nanometer process, so the 6000 series had to be designed on the inferior 40 nanometer process instead. What this meant for AMD was that they could no longer design such elaborate or power efficient cards. A spanner in the works for the 6000 series indeed. So with that in mind it's impressive what AMD still managed to achieve. The 6800 series was almost as fast as the 5800 series had been, despite the cards having significantly fewer transistors and stream processors. It wasn't until two months later that the flagship 6900 series came out, which was finally a considerable speed improvement over AMD's previous 5000 generation of cards but it still wasn't fast enough to beat Nvidia's 500 series, and ultimately AMD's 6000 series of cards became just a decent stopgap until the next generation. So in contrast to that, AMD's 7000 series of cards got it right. They were based on a new improved architecture, and it stole the 6000 series thunder by finally dropping down to a smaller, now 28 nanometer node. So I'm not saying it's a disappointment for doing that, that bit's a success. I'm just saying that it made it out to be a greater leap in performance than it would have been had AMD's 6000 series not been shafted by a cancelled node shrink. These two things combined made it significantly faster than the 6000 series was, and indeed any of Nvidia's cards at the time. They were still stuck on the 500 series by then. And just in case you're wondering why I'm ignoring all these cards up here, that's because these are two cards in one. There are all kinds of problems with these, like bad frame times, limited support in applications and so on, and ultimately one more powerful card won out as being the more practical solution. So that's why I'm ignoring these seemingly incredible looking graphics cards, and is kind of the reason why they no longer exist today. So it's no wonder that the 7000 series was seen as being a success, but I believe a lot of that was down to AMD's previous generation being underwhelming, and because Nvidia's competing generation came out a bit later. So while the 7000 series was undisputedly the best when it came out, it was less of a victory than it first looked. It was not a win for consumers in all the ways we might have come to expect from a new generation of graphics cards. Even the reviews at the time hinted at some of the trade-offs AMD had made with this launch, the first thing being its value proposition. Historically, a new generation meant faster flagship cards at the same high-end price as older ones, which in turn improved the price performance all the way down the stack. But this didn't happen with the 7000 series. Instead, new cards which were faster were priced higher, while those which performed similarly to older cards were priced similarly also. As Anantec pointed out, the 7800 series only moved a small distance along the price performance curve, 
and that AMD's fastest 7970 card, despite being from a new generation, was still priced more like a previous generation one would have been, as opposed to actually beating those older cards for value. I'm not saying the Radeon 7000 series is to blame for the price performance stagnation that we now see so much of, but the very fact that these graphics cards remained relevant for so many years suggests that it was this era that was either the last of the good days or the very start of the bad ones, and more likely the latter given that this generation didn't care too much about advancing the price performance curve either. AMD didn't choose to price this generation of cards too aggressively, which was probably good for them but not so much for us. But it wasn't just the value of these cards that progressed too little for my liking. I also think the Radeon 7000 series' performance leap over the 6000 series was disappointing. This was hard to tell at release though, because on paper it looks great. The 7970 has 33% more cores than the 6970 did, it performs 41% faster and consumes roughly 6% more power. So we're getting performance and power efficiency improvements right there. But how much of this is from the new architecture, and how much of it is from the node shrink? The significance of 28 nanometers cannot be understated, because in the world of graphics cards, and computers in general, a smaller node is as close to magic as you can get. It can do anything, you can use it to make things smaller, or more efficient, or just to cram more stuff into the same space to make it faster, and it's what's driven most of the progress computers have seen in the last few decades. But it's hard to tell how much of the Radeon 7000's improvements came from this. Being a new architecture, you can't directly compare it with previous AMD cards, and being new 28 nanometers, you can't really compare it with Nvidia's offerings either. Not fairly, at least. But given that 40 nanometer cards were all that Nvidia had at the time, that had to do. As Anantec says, the 7970 is only around 15 to 25 percent faster than the GTX 580. Only 15 to 25 percent faster than a 15-month-old card based on the inferior 40 nanometer process. Luckily for AMD, speed wasn't Nvidia's primary focus. They already had that. Their problem was heat and power consumption. The GeForce 480, when it was released, was the fastest card in the world, but it was so disgustingly power hungry that it was barely a win when up against AMD's far smaller, more efficient, and only slightly slower designs. The GeForce 580 went a long way towards remedying the 480's problems. It consumed less power, it ran cooler, and managed a bit of a speed boost as well. And the 600 series carried on this tradition. As AMD's cards were growing bigger and faster, Nvidia's were getting smaller and more efficient. And it was this era when their paths finally crossed, the situation reversing itself. Now both finally on the same 28 nanometer process, the only differences between AMD's and Nvidia's cards would be the architectural designs and die sizes. Two months after the 7970's release came Nvidia's GeForce 680, and it was faster, less power hungry, and quieter than the Radeon 7970 was. Now both compared on a level 28 nanometer playing field, it was clear that Nvidia's cards had the advantage. And it would be almost 10 years before AMD's cards could catch up with Nvidia for efficiency again. That is why I see the Radeon 7000 series as being a disappointment. It was the first time in years that AMD was behind Nvidia for both performance and efficiency. We just didn't know that until after its release. Let's compare 28 nanometer AMD versus 28 nanometer Nvidia. The Radeon 7970 was 41% faster than its predecessor, while the GeForce 680 was 37% faster than its predecessor. Win to AMD there. The 7970 consumed 6% more power than its predecessor, while the GeForce 680 consumed 15% less. Considerable efficiency win for Nvidia right there. But the biggest change was to the die sizes. The 7970 was 6% smaller than its predecessor, while the GeForce 680 was 43% smaller than the 580 was. Suddenly the 7000's improvements seem a little disappointing, don't they? Let's move away from AMD for a moment and take a look at the GeForce 500 series. You can see as the cards get faster and higher up the stack, they switch to bigger die sizes. Now here's Nvidia's 600 series. The miracle product being this one here, codenamed the GK104. At 294mm squared, it's smaller than even the GeForce 560 had been, yet it was still powerful enough to scale right up to the GeForce 680, beating the Radeon 7970 which had a larger die size still. But where's the proper successor to the GeForce 580? Where's the 500mm monster that had previously powered the flagship graphics cards? Well, now that the GeForce 680 was effectively a mid-range product that had the performance to be sold at high-end prices, this left Nvidia free to charge whatever they wanted for their real high-end card. A year later it was released, it was called the GeForce Titan, establishing a new tier of performance for graphics cards, and, more importantly, a new price tier. They charged $1000 for it, 
for a die size that in previous generations sold at $500. Imagine spending $1000 on a graphics card. Unthinkable. Until the Titan. But this was when a single graphics card finally became so much faster than anything else on the market that it could warrant such a high price. All made possible, in part because Nvidia 600 series was better than anybody expected it to be, but also in part because AMD 7000 series was not as fast as maybe it should have been. After the Titan came out, AMD couldn't quite ever pull ahead of Nvidia again. Anytime they launched a fast new product, Nvidia would respond in weeks, or maybe even days, with something faster. The 290X was met by the 780 Ti, just two weeks later. And their Fury X card was met by the 980 Ti, the following day. And during the periods where Nvidia had no competition from AMD, they dominated the high end with their Titan class cards. Priced well over $1000 for the people who really wanted the best. It's clear to me that Nvidia was in no rush to reveal their best products. They released them all twice, first as a Titan class product for people wanting the best no matter the price, and then again a bit later on after AMD had finally caught up, but this time at a lower price. What a frustrating situation for AMD to be in. It might have all been different had Nvidia released their 600 series before AMD launched their 7000s. What if the Titan had been classed and sold at the 680 and priced accordingly? I wish I knew the answers, but I don't. But I do know the way that things actually panned out perfectly set the stage for a more expensive tier of graphics card to emerge, and the Radeon 7000 series' performance and efficiency is partly responsible for that. I'm not saying we wouldn't eventually have had $1000 cards anyway, but it might have taken just that little bit longer to reach that point, had AMD launched the 7000 series with enough power to challenge Nvidia's fastest. There was a time when AMD's graphics cards were the efficient ones, but following the release of the GeForce 600 series, that situation reversed itself, and AMD became the company with the reputation of being more power hungry. If you want my opinion on why this is, I think it's because they had to overclock their products more to make up for whatever performance gap there was between their products and Nvidia's. I mean, you only have to look at what happened immediately after the GeForce 680's launch. AMD countered it by re-releasing the 7970, but as the overclocked Gigahertz edition, which in addition to being faster, was also hotter and more power hungry. A sign of things to come. And this happened time and time again over the following years, and I'll go through some examples to prove it. Just before the Radeon 290 was released, Nvidia cut their prices. So the 290 got a last minute change as well, this time to its fan speeds, which made it run faster, but also louder, hotter and more power hungry than where it left a thermally throttle at a lower clock speed instead. Vega was a notoriously late counter to Nvidia's 1000 series, so I think AMD felt they had to beat the GeForce 1080 with it. And they did so with the Vega 64 by again clocking it far higher than it was comfortable running at, which resulted in an especially hot and power hungry card. It's a shame because you could get great results from Vega by undervolting and by underclocking them. But you shouldn't have to. And you don't have to with the GeForce cards, because they already come in an efficient configuration to begin with. And despite all the fanfare for Polaris and how efficient the Radeon 400 series would be, it still ultimately fell slightly short of the GeForce 1060's speed and efficiency, which was released soon after. So what did AMD do? The same as always. They responded with the 500 series, which was clocked higher to help it compete with the 1060, but of course it threw efficiency out of the window, as was AMD's tried and tested strategy by that point. Why all this talk about efficiency? Surely, for buyers of these cards, it's the price and the performance that matters more. Yes, for buyers that's true, but this video isn't a buyer's guide. I'm here to assess the Radeon 7000 series' legacy, and efficiency plays a very large part in that, and clearly explains the start of their uphill struggle against Nvidia, which was a situation which lasted for many years after. Efficiency plays a large part in determining which company's products are ahead, and trading in this area has many negative knock-on consequences, which AMD and the consumer bore the full brunt of. So with hindsight, the Radeon 7000 series looked good because it was the last time that AMD were first to market with a new tier of performance, and thus were able to design and to clock their cards at the levels they were designed to look good at. And I am absolutely sure that had the G4 600 series released before the Radeon 7000 series, then the 7970 would have shipped in a much more highly clocked state, and AMD would have gained a reputation for being hotter and more inefficient one generation sooner than it ultimately did with its GCN era cards. So those are the reasons why I believe the 7000 series could be seen as a disappointment. But for consumers who bought one of these products, they were great. 
For a start, it was launched at the right time to be able to power an entire generation of console games. It was based on the shiny new GCN architecture, making it similar to the ones found in the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. This meant the 7000 series was all but guaranteed to be able to run that generation of games, right up until the next generation was released eight years later in 2020. This gave the graphics card a very good lifespan, and its drivers were supported right through until 2021. Plus, AMD, ever generous with their RAM allocations back then, equipped the 7900 series with 3GB of the stuff, which was 50% more than Nvidia's 2GB standard on their 670 and 680 cards. Not like it made much of a difference back then, but anybody still on these cards today will be appreciating it now. The GCN architecture proved to be excellent for mining too, so they found a use in the crypto booms that followed, in addition to remaining just decent mid-range gaming cards, still achieving similar performance to the new low and mid-range cards that were released many years later. And while the 7000 series didn't exactly release at groundbreaking prices, the fact that price performance in the graphics card market all but stalled for many years after their release meant that they became good investments, in a way that the generations before them did not. In conclusion, History has been kind to the 7000 series, but I think they showed signs of weaknesses that later AMD graphics card generations were plagued by. And it was only because AMD was first to market with the 7000 series that it didn't gain the same bad reputation for being slower and less efficient than Nvidia's alternatives were. Compared with the eras either side, the GCN era as a whole was disastrous for AMD. No, seriously. It was disastrous, even if the current crazy prices and rampant scalping may make us look back at that era fondly. I doubt AMD feels the same way though. And if you can look through all the current craziness and at AMD's current underlying architectures, it's clear that with RDNA, they're in a better position now than they have been for many years. Replacing GCN with RDNA did wonders for their card's efficiency, and RDNA 2 has taken further steps to help catch up in other areas as well. Hopefully you've enjoyed this sort of retrospective look at graphics cards. I am a big fan of looking back and at telling stories that wouldn't have been possible without hindsight. And I think there's value to doing this. For instance, I'm seeing a similar situation occurring right now with the latest generations of graphics card. Currently, AMD and Nvidia are virtually neck and neck for rasterization performance. But just like with the Radeon 7000 series, AMD is relying on a superior node to get them there. So the worry right now is that if Nvidia were to switch to the same node as AMD is using, that they would be ahead again. We'll just have to wait a year or so to find out. And then maybe 10 years before I construct a similar video about this current situation.